Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Atomic Testing Museum Distinguished Lecture Webinar with uh, Mr. Gary L. Ho. He's going to be talking about Fukushima Daiichi accident 10 years later. Uh, we're so excited to have him here with us tonight and also having all of you. So thank you so much for taking time out of your Thursday evening to be with us. Um, just a couple announcements before we get started. I do want to mention that we have a upcoming uh, webinar on April 10th. That is going to be the plants and animals of the Nevada National Security Site. That's going to be Saturday, April 10th, um, 2021 at 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time and 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And so it's going to be uh, Derek Hall, uh, who works at this site, talking about the plants and animals of the Nevada National Security Site. So we're excited to have that one. But that's not why you're here. The reason you're here is to talk about um, what would be learned from from Fukushima and, and the accident that took place there. So one thing I do wanna mention is that um, Mr. Ho has graciously offered to send any of those, um, any of you who are interested in seeing his PowerPoint presentation that he'll have uh, tonight. Um, he's interested in, you know, if, if you want a copy, uh, please reach out to me. I will happily send it your way. And I will uh, drop my web or my email address in the chat so if you if you do want a copy please email me and we'll get that uh, handled for you um also we are going to um be asking mr ho questions audience audience questions um so drop them in throughout but we will be asking those questions um at the end of uh, after his presentation is over um so definitely drop some questions in as he's talking and we'll we'll go through those and um, ask him at the end. Um, so without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce Mr. Gary Ho. Uh, now Gary graduated with a BSEE from the Air Force Academy in 1969 and received his MSEE from the Air Force Institute of Technology in 1973. And uh, licensed in multiple states since 1975, he has held a number of other professional certifications as well. During a 26 year Air Force career, he has worked on gunship, night vision devices, reconnaissance systems, flight simulators, uh, recruiting and, and nuclear weapons effects tests. Uh, he was a technical director of two nuclear events at the Nevada test site, um, which um, of course is a great connection with us here at the museum um, and a resident instrumentation engineer at the Kirtland Air Force Base uh, electromagnetic pulse test facilities. He was responsible for the nuclear safety analysis and bed down of the Peacekeeper ICBM in Wyoming in 1985 and witnessed the one and only launch of the small ICBM before the Soviet Union gave up. After his Air Force retirement, he briefly joined two A&E firms and designed the electrical portion of Motorola's COM-1 uh, water wafer fab in Phoenix, then worked for 16 years at Sandia National Labs. There he served the facilities engineering department as the nuclear reactor and test range site manager. The lighting engineer and team lead, condition assessment chief, and the electrical engineer for the National Solar Thermal Test Facility, uh, the solar power tower. Now retired for good, he is a docent at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History and consults part-time with solar energy, uh, a solar energy firm in Santa Fe. So it is with great pleasure on behalf of the National Atomic Test Museum that I introduce Mr. Gary Hell. And I thank you very much for inviting me and to let me give this presentation. This is one that I have uh, stitched together from several different places. Of course, you've, uh, we have received a number of briefings at our museum as well and from Sandia Laboratories people who are with, uh, with the visitors to our museum who are interested in what happened to Fukushima because we too have a nuclear reactor and power section there. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get with it as uh, quickly as we can on this. And uh, we'll just go through that. Uh, I have updated it to this month, but I've been working on this kind of a thing for quite some time and um, we'll take a look at it. Um, we'll go through this and well, let's see how if I can get it go down. There we go. Um, we will go down through this to uh, talk about how nuclear power works for a little bit. Uh, uranium metal is very small part of uranium is the uranium-235, which is the 
unstable isotope that makes a good power for reactors and also makes the uh, the core of a good set of nuclear weapons. Uh, its critical mass is about 51, 52 kilograms right there, which is a ball about the size of grapefruit. That's how heavy it is. The numbers that I want to get down at the bottom is this, that if you burn a carbon atom, which you get from coal or oil or natural gas, you get a power, a set of power out of it called two electron volts. Now that's not very big, but you get two of them when you burn that atom into an atom of carbon dioxide. However, if you split one atom of uranium or an atom of plutonium for that matter, you get 200 million electron volts. So you can get a tremendous amount of power out of very little space in these things. And that's one reason why uh, we support nuclear uh, power. And that's what we'll do. At the very bottom, uh, it just simply says that if you split 10 to the 19th atoms per second, you get about 300 megawatts worth of power out of it. And that's a good reactor number. And not gonna go through much of this. I wanted to see the first part in there. The radiation is absorbed in uh, the heat in the shielding of the reactor. And this is also true if it's a non-reactor in something like a laboratory or other uh, ways that you might be shielded from it. Uh, it's in metric, there's 30 feet of water, 12 feet of concrete, uh, three feet of iron, one foot of lead stops all radiation, every single bit of it. But they get hot because that energy absorbed in there. Most of the energy, however, comes from the fission fragments. As you split that atom, it flies apart and the momentum slams into other atoms around and that heats up the fuel. And uh, so that is where most of the heat comes. Then the coolant water, in this case, in reactors at uh, Fukushima, it's a boiling water reactor. It directly boils the water into steam. Other ones use pressurized water or gas or liquid metal, uh, primarily sodium for the liquid metal. And then that goes through a heat exchanger, which then boils water that would go into the turbine hull to generate power. Uh, it is controlled by borated rods. Of course, we don't use them in a weapon, but boron is an element that, um, soaks up neutrons without doing much of anything. So if we use borated rods or borated plates and slide them in between the various fuel sections in the reactor, that acts like a throttle. And then we scram it um, by dropping all of the rods in there, it shuts the reactor down. But some of those elements up there, much, much like uh, you probably have seen cars that they turn off and then the fan runs for a little while because it's still hot. Those fission fragments that are in there, the fission fragments that were being created just before the reactor shuts down, still produce heat. And that is critical because even though the reactor scrammed at Fukushima, that remaining 7% of heat is what actually melted it. We'll go on down to that. Here is a picture of the Fukushima plant. And um, uh, it has six reactors in it, uh, almost uh, 4,700 megawatts, 4.7 4 gigawatts worth of power. The first one was a Mark I reactor. All of these are from GE and has been operating since 1971. That's reactor number one uh, right down in here. And that is uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, they are right there. And even at the time of the accident, that reactor number one was 40 years old. And then there's five and six up here on a hill. Uh, they're still as part of the plant, but they um, are separate from the first four and went in a different time. Then we also have these, these towers here, which is the electrical towers that spread it throughout the city. Uh, the town uh, back here in the Fukushima prefecture uh, is still there. It's more or less abandoned at the moment. And in this particular picture, you see the inlet lagoon that they have with the seawall around it. These are the intakes for the cooling water. They don't have cooling towers. They simply suck up the ocean and use that to heat and condense the steam. And then over here uh, on the left, you see uh, outfall of the steam coming, uh, of the hot water coming back out into the ocean. And that's right here. And then for the other two plants, it's up here. So then we'll go to the next page. This is what the boiling water reactor looks like. And it's a generation two reactor, which means it's kind of old. As I said, it's 40 years old from that time. Now it's 50 years old. There's a cutaway picture on the left and a, a much simpler artist conception on the right. And uh, in the, oops, would go back up one. Uh, right here is the reactor itself. The core is where all the uranium is. And then this is the pressure vessel and it's got a pool of water in it 
the cool water comes in from the turbine hall after it's been condensed by the ocean and it goes in here. It is then heated and boiled into steam, which comes to the top of the pressure vessel and then heads out here and goes off to the turbine hall. Now that's the, the vessel and the, and the pressure vessel that keeps it going. It's also lined with iron. That's the red around here. And then the, the gray is concrete. That is the containment vessel. And then the whole thing sits in a, a, a warehouse or a shed. It's a, the equipment building. And the upper deck is frangible. We'll get to that. Now here is a swimming pool, if you will. And it's about 35, 40 feet deep because when they take out a, a used up fuel rod, uh, from the reactor, it comes up in here, is picked up by this crane. It might go into this cask over here on the left that you see and either come down and go out this tunnel where it would be taken to uh, uh, storage someplace else. But most of the time it will be put down in the swimming pool right here uh, to cool for a while. So that that 7% residual heat then goes away and the thing can be handled. And so does most of the radiation. Most of the radiation goes away as well. Uh, to the next one. Here is the timeline for the, uh, the quake. The earthquake happened at that hour. Uh, it was magnitude nine plus. Some have said 9.1, and that's a, uh, that's a huge number. It's one of the largest ones ever been recorded since we had the Richter scale. The Richter scale is logarithmic. I think a magnitude eight is still 10 times less than a magnitude nine. It was huge. And somebody computed the energy that it gave out in uh, nine gigatons of TNT. It would be one heck of a bomb. Uh, it's off the shore of um, Japan, as you can see in the map on the upper left. And Japan and the entire Pacific is part of what they call the ring of fire. Uh, there is a huge Pacific plate and it moves. And then there is an Asian plate and other ones. And as that plate moves under the, uh, the other plates, they do cause, uh, they get a lot of strain in them. And then after a while, something pops and uh, you have an earthquake. And you, in this case, you also have a move of the plate under one. And it happened to be the Japan, Jap Japanese plate or the plate that Japan sits on. It moved the entire country of Japan to 2.4 meters. And because that was a relocation of a huge mass, it also shifted the earth's uh, rotation point so that the North Pole is now 10 centimeters away from where it used to be. And much as you have seen probably an ice skater, uh, she starts out by, uh, by spinning and then she pulls her arms in to spin very rapidly. Uh, the opposite would be if she puts her arms out, they slow down. And by moving Japan to where it was, it shortened the day by 1.8 microseconds. Uh, that doesn't matter too much. My watch is not that accurate in the first place. But that is a huge impact on this thing. One of the other things that it did was about 45 minutes later, since the uh, quake was out in the ocean, here came the tsunami. And because the quake was huge, so was the tsunami. And it was pretty much aimed right at Fukushima. Uh, I, there are dozens of pictures on the internet that you can do. These are two that uh, show me. That's the entire uh, front coast of the country right there, completely swept away. Uh, and replaced with debris. And on the right, you've got an ocean going freighter sitting there in somebody's front yard. Uh, that is a very impressive picture to me. It inundated six, uh, seven, 675 kilometers of the coast. The heights were uh, seven meters or so. The, the seawall around the Fukushima power plant was only six meters. So uh, three meters, uh, a meter of water, three feet of water went over. And here are the numbers. Um, you probably heard more about the reactor in the news than you did the uh, people, but almost 20,000 people are dead and um, 6,000 hurt and there's another 2,500 still missing. And after 10 years, that's a current number, by the way, and after 10 years, probably most people will take that 2,500 and add it to the dead. And shortly after the event, of course, four and a half million people were powerless and one and a half didn't have water. And because of the uh, reaction, of the damage to the power plant, the uh, Japanese government forcibly uh, evacuated 165,000 people from the Fukushima prefecture. We'll get into that in a little bit. So here's the uh, uh, sequence of events. The earthquake quicks, quits. The reactors auto scram. Uh, they hear, hear the, uh, they feel the seismic, seismic effect and they say, okay, this is out of limits. And the uh, automatic uh, actions drop the 
uh, boron rods into the reactor and it turns off and the plant goes offline. Uh, they has emergency diesels. They all start as design systems are powered up. And the plant operators are beginning to go back and say, okay, can we restart this thing? But 45 minutes later, the tsunami hits. And the switch yard is shorted out and completely destroyed. Uh, Seawater is, is salty, and so that makes it electrically conductive. The diesel fuel tanks were destroyed. And for some reason, the uh, diesel generators themselves were down in the basement, actually below the water line. So when that extra meter of, uh, of tsunami, tsunami came in, it filled up the diesels and they all stop uh, with the exception of one diesel up on units five and six, but they're not running anyway because half of the reactors were uh, defueled, uh, but they're up on the hill. And now the only thing left is battery systems, uh, what we call uninterruptible power supplies, but the UPS is actually do interrupt when the batteries die. And about nine hours later, it's midnight. This, this happened in the middle of the afternoon, and now it's midnight. The valves close, the pump, the lights go out, all the gauges go to zero, and there's nothing that you can hear except the pounding of very scared hearts inside that uh, system there. Um, people were just absolutely terrified. This had never happened to them in any of their simulation or training at all. And because of this, and you'll see in the next pictures here, the water levels in the reactors begin to drop as that residual heat, that remaining 7%, boil it away. Uh, the falling water un uncovers the cores in one, two, and three. Those are the only reactors working. Four, five, and six were down uh, for refueling, so they're not really hurt. Uh, and they were uncovered for most of the day. The fuel temperature rises to a tremendous amount, a, a, a tremendous temperature as the water boils away. And the, uh, the fuel rods are made out of zirconium. That's another material, metal, that doesn't uh, get affected by radiation very much. So we can use them to uh, make fuel rods out of, to clad the fuel rods. But when they do burn at that temperature, they suck oxygen out of the cooling water, uh, leaving you with hydrogen gas at the end of it. And that's very important because the hydrogen gas got out as the pressure rose inside the pressure vessel emergency vents vented that. And then for some reason, it's inside the building instead of outside the building. And the other thing is that the vents inside the building, the vent fans that would have normally ventilated it, they're turned off too because there's no power and there's no gauges, so nobody knows that. And after a day and a half, a random spark ignites that hydrogen bubble and it blows off the frangible panels of the, uh, the first reactor at number, number three, and then the rest of them eventually uh, damaged as well. The spent fuel pools also begin to dry up. They don't have near as much uh, heat in them because it's fuel rods that have been out for quite a while, but it's still pretty warm. Um, it actually would be pretty nice to swim in at spa type temperature, about 100 degrees or so, um, but that hastens the water's evaporation. And that also isn't known because nobody's up there and there's no gauges. And worse off, unit four, the pool was cracked and it drained a little faster, but it took a couple of days and nobody noticed it. In desperation, they got some fire trucks and they welded uh, some fire truck hose connections into the piping in there and uh, started pumping in seawater. That's all they had, just threw the hose out into the ocean and pumped in seawater. So now instead of using a, a deionized and, and pure water, you're in there with seawater, fish pee, everything else that might be in there and it adds to the contamination. And that is also something that um, uh, cluttered the place up. This is what it looks like. There's an overhead view over here. Here's reactors one, two, three, and four, and their turbine house and all of that. And there's the intake uh, lagoon and the outfall is going out here. And then after the tsunami came by, the switchyard is completely destroyed. The frangible roof off of number three has already blown off and notice these diesel tanks up here, they're gone. And that's what, no more diesel fuel, plus the diesels had been swamped in the basement of the turbine houses right here and they're not running and that's why the system was out of power. Um, here is what happened is back to the uh, little um, illustrations that we have. They had an emergency steam cooling system right here that the steam in the reactor is going to the powerhouse comes down here, turns the turbine and picks up water from the wet well, goes through a pump and replenishes the water in the reactor. But here's the catch. 
the valve is electric. So when you lose power, you also lose this, the valve eventually closed. And so that system no longer worked. And now you simply had a pressure relief valve that started dumping the steam down into the wet well, which gets the wet well hot because you're, you're simply using warm water to cool steam and, that, and the steam condenses down there and you can see the water level beginning to fall in the reactor. And finally over here in this page, you get down to this point here that now the, the steam and the other items that are released from the melting fuel, uh, there is almost no water left in the reactor. The uh, water in the wet well is warm and um, not really good for cooling. It's beginning to flood into the containment area. And there's another little pressure relief valve that comes out here. And that's the one that vented the cloud of hydrogen inside the building. And when the building blew, it's also the one that spread some gases like xenon and um, vapors from iodine and some of the other reaction products that are in there. Uh, now, here is the status of units one, two, and three. Now, as I said, four, five, and six are undamaged. They weren't running. So unit one, um, all of them have melted down through the bottom and it's uh, cluttered down here in the bottom of the containment area. Uh, down here in this one, and this one has the worst bit uh, because it's also got the most water. So it's making uh, some rust and other debris down in here. And this is where some of the contamination is coming. I'm not sure why this thing ever had a wet well down here that is connected to the containment area, but it does. And because of that, as this stuff dissolves, it also gets uh, down in here to this water, and that's what they have to take care of. Um, and the, the normal area that would pump this out is the pump system for the reactors. And of course, that's not working. And besides, the, uh, the tsunami flooded that the pump room and the pump's uh, motors are destroyed. It can't work. But they are uh, no longer hot. This has been, well, 10 years, but in a couple of couple of days the thing was down to room temperature no longer melting all the melting took place in the first day the groundwater leaking through the building is not being removed by the sump pumps that don't work but they are uh, collecting that and putting it in some tankage that we'll see later uh, the contamination particulates liquid and gases most of the particulates are in the water sumps the wet wells and in the containment vessel as designed it's not another chernobyl because it didn't blow it out and the reactor did not catch on the fire it's still within the containment area. And most of that is just the, the crumbled fuel rods and things like that. Uh, two products down there that do have a longer half-life are cesium-137 and strontium-90. They have 29 and 30 year half-lives. Most of the rest of it is about um, uh, hours to a couple of days. Those are the only two that have a longer half-life. Uh, for those of us that have hair color like mine, we probably remember that we had um, drills to go to a fallout shelter, which we would, in, in case of nuclear war, and we would have to stay there about two weeks or so. And uh, after that, there would be an uh, okay to come back up because all of the uh, really active uh, isotopes from a nuclear war or a reactor accident would have died off because the radiation is a zero sum game. The more reactive an isotope is, the faster it burns itself up. Uh, the liquids were, again, iodine, but that's only got an eight-day half-life. It's all gone. Uh, there's also some xenon. That's a noble gas that doesn't bond with anything. And after less than a week, it was all gone. Uh, here's just one on radiation. Um, I put it in there for, for the, uh, the record. Uh, too many people said the reactor is spewing radiation into the air. Well, it doesn't. Uh, it just radiates it into the containment wall vessels. And most of it uh, that actually got out in the environment is carried by water. Uh, water doesn't get radioactive either. It's pretty, that's why we can use it as a coolant, but it will carry uh, any contamination that is dissolved in it. The radiation doses are very small. Um, those of you that live down near sea level get about a quarter of a centisievert uh, a year. Um, and at this altitude, I live a mile high. Uh, we get about a third of a centisievert of just background radiation. And of the 7,800 plant workers, they only had about two or three times of background radiation for the whole year. 30 of them might have had 10 centisieverts, which in the old style is a rad. Uh, the radiological worker is allowed to have five centisieverts, five rads a year. 
but it takes about 100 of RADs to uh, get you sick, give you the first nausea and symptoms, and pretty much 1,000 RADs to guarantee death. So they're nowhere near any kind of trouble at all. And we'll come back to that, neighbor, neighbor, uh, that number later. I would point out that cancer treatment with radiation routinely hits the tumor with 5,000 RADs or sinusieverts, but that is focused on the tumor and not the rest of the body. And so that's why it's not a lethal dose. So where are we now? The plant's offline, the infrastructure is damaged. They have not worried about uh, setting up the power plant anymore or anything else like that. They're gonna take it apart. The reactors and fuel assemblies are cool. There's no more contamination being released except by the water that drains through it. There are some areas in two or three are hot. That's the little puddles that I showed you in the past. Uh, this, the spent fuel pool that was cracked is now patched and refilled, but it was contaminated inside. Uh, they did harvest some food and look at it and confiscate it in the Fukushima area for that summer, but no one got sick at all. However, of the 165,000 people that were required to evacuate, 1% of them died from the evacuation, from the accident and from the stress and heart attacks and things like that of taking people out of their homeland and forcibly moving them. And um, so that was the evacuation plan. And even though no, nobody got hurt from the plant, 1,660 people were died in moving it out. And of course, five and six are completely undamaged. Uh, they could be started up at any time. Reactor four could be also with some repairs, but it's also another 40 year old reactor now 50 year old since, since we're 10 years beyond that. And it's not worth doing. Uh, but I don't know that five or six will ever be started because of the politics. TEPCO, the te uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company is inviting others to watch and help. They're being very open with this. At the back end, I've got a, a website you can go to for status on it, and it's in English. They are pumping out the water that's contaminated and demineralizing it, much like we'd use a water softener to get heavy metals and materials out of our drinking water, but they're storing it in tanks because they don't know what to do with it yet. It does have some tritium in it. They're decontaminating the buildings. They have uh, built another building that is a, 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 a melted fuel decontamination building. Uh, they've sampled everything and it's all below the free release limits. Um, and so that they're able to let people coming back in, but many people are not wanting to because Japan was bombed in World War II are rapidly afraid of radiation at all. And only a third of the people who are able to come back in or have been allowed to come back in have decided to do so. I don't know what they'll do with one, two, and three. Um, we still have Three Mile Island, number two, which melted uh, many years before that. And uh, it's still there because they're still looking at it. What I would suggest that they do is call entombment. Um, you remember from the little picture that I showed you, there is a huge concrete and steel containment vessel that looks like a pear that the reactor sits in. And uh, I would simply suggest that they fill it up with that 12 feet of concrete and let it sit there. That's what the Air Force did. This is an overhead view of a small reactor that the Air Force had at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. I used to work there. Um, that little pressure dome has got a small reactor in it. And underneath it, there was a train track that had a small model train track that would take military equipment down under the reactor to be irradiated to see how it worked. And when they finished that, they took the fuel out and gave it back to the Atomic Energy Connect Commission, which is now the Department of Energy, and uh, simply filled that entire dome with concrete. So it's there sitting as a giant rock is what it is. So, uh, completely shielded. Uh, it does have no radiation at all coming out of it. And the rest of the building that you see there sort of wrapped around it is a machine shop and a work area, and they still use the thing. And you, in fact, you can see about four or five cars parked out in front of it. That's what I would suggest they do with the reactors, but of course I'm not there, so I don't get to decide. Um, the other things here, they're looking at areas to decontaminate it. Uh, they do have ice dams. They have frozen some of the water with a refrigeration system. They put sluice gates and blocking it, trying to block the, the ground flow, but they still have pumped up water. Um, they have set aside $62 billion uh, for cleanup costs. They think it'll take another 40 years. I don't want to read the slide to you, but there we go. I still want to come down that all other nuclear power companies are reviewing safety designs. When we get back to that, it'll be generation three plus, which is generation three reactors with more stuff. 
Uh, and again, I say zero radiation industry injuries around the plant. And Hurricane Sandy, uh, last uh, time I did this, we had Hurricane Sandy up near the Northeast and it did not damage the Northeast nuclear power plants. Um, Vermont, uh, Pilgrim and a few things like that, they just ran just fine. Um, and, are, and some of them still are. So here we are now, uh, this is the site. And again, you can see out here the seawall and the site itself. And now there's cranes all the way around it. And all of these things right here are water tanks. There's about a million pounds of water being stored here and it's essentially drinkable. Uh, they've taken all of the uh, contaminants out of it except one, which is some trit tritium, uh, which can be drunk. It's a very, uh, um, very thin, uh, very, very mild contamination, but it's not zero. Uh, there's a lot of people say put it out in the ocean and uh, it would be fine. When we changed out one of our reactor water systems at uh, uh, Sandia National Laboratories, we had up 80,000 gallons of slightly treated water. What are we going to do with it? Uh, we gave it to our contamination control people and they simply put it out in a lagoon and let it evaporate. Uh, the fire department volunteered to take it and use it to uh, water the trees and stuff around, but they wouldn't let them have it. So all they did was let it evaporate and there it is. The other thing they have done is they went out and they looked for contamination that got to the countryside and uh, a Geiger counter is not specifically, um, it's not specific. So if it says it's radioactive, it may or may not have come from the plant. But uh, whenever they saw that, they, they picked it up and scooped it up. And we have acres and acres and acres of giant plastic bags of very fine topsoil. And they didn't have to do that. Uh, the thing is that it also uh, destroys the uh, farming capability for that. Anybody that's a gardener knows that you stick the seed down in the first inch of the topsoil, but they took the first four inches and uh, now you're down into the clay and the other stuff like that. So it, it wrecked it, I'm, I'm vexed about that too. Um, what we have learned is the worst possible scenario can get worse. Don't plan on plant integrity alone and don't depend on one failure at a time. We had plans for an earthquake, plans for a tsunami, plans for being disconnected from the Tokyo power system. They did not have plans for all three at the same time. The other thing is, is don't try to run it from headquarters. Let the local person uh, do it because there were a lot of things that took extra time to get done because I always phone home and find out what do I do next? What do I do next? Uh, and that should have been shortened by allowing it. The other thing is that we should use uh, hardened cameras and sensors. Um, since then, we've got cameras that work on fiber optics and we have hardened fiber optics that don't fog up with radiation. Those should be installed. We should add emergency hose taps to piping as part of the design rather than uh, cutting them in with the fire department after the thing has uh, had an accident. Uh, of course, there's always suggestions to include, re include redundancies, uh, share protective technologies from other plants and other uh, manufacturers. All of our uh, reactors in this particular plant came from General Electric and you can recover, uh, but it'll be uh, economically and polit politically costly. Um, but the corrections to go from generation three to generation three plus is costing about 4 million, 40 million per reactor throughout the world that are going to do that. So I got one grim picture here. This is a picture of uh, um, Hiroshima right after it was bombed and it's in September uh, after the surrender and the army of occupation is in there taking these pictures. Uh, the industrial industrious Japanese have already started clearing up some of the roads and stuff like that. Uh, and that was 1945, zero containment, huge radiation dose, lots of contamination. And less than 60 years later, uh, it's a modern city of two and a half million people and absolutely no radiation at all. And that's true of Nagasaki as well. Here are the radiation levels at uh, Fukushima. It is a screen capture, so I need to tell you the units. The units over here um, are on the order of millisieverts per year, uh, which is uh, tenths of a rad per year. And it peaked out at 20. So it would come up with two rads would be your maximum the day of the event and then it very quickly tapers off. So this is the 14th of uh, March and here we are the 1st of April, two weeks later and you can see it's already down this far. So that's what I was saying as, as a matter of fallout and things like that, if we had had a nuclear bomb attack and fallout, 
uh, we could stay in there about two weeks and then things would be all better and we'd be down like this. The uh, uh, turquoise line here is the normal background radiation that you have at sea level. For those of us up at a mile high, it's a little higher than that, um, <clears throat> but not bad at all. Uh, and the annual background dose for me is, is three millisieverts and they only got up to about uh, 180 and it very quickly bled back off. Uh, of the other accidents we've had, <clears throat> they're in two groups. Since I did work in weapon, we made 69,000 nuclear weapons over the Cold War. We tested 1,000, uh, dropped two in combat, and out of the 68,000 remain, we've had 32 accidents involving 47 of them. So even though the accident record isn't perfect, the uh, safety record is because none of those 47 weapons produce any nuclear yield at all, none. And in fact, one of them fell out of a B-36 here at Albuquerque and uh, it destroyed itself with the high, high explosive yield, but it didn't have any nuclear material in it. We've also lost two submarines, a Scorpion for one, Thresher for the other one, and they went down with their nuclear reactors, but that's a different thing. They don't have the weapons on board. There was one person died from a radiological accident during the Manhattan Project, but in all of the atmospheric testing, which for us was about 350 some odd tests, both in the South Pacific and at the Nevada test site before 1962's uh, atmospheric test ban treaty, zero deaths, absolutely none. And then for the three reactor accidents, we've only had three. Three Mile Island was a meltdown of one, Fukushima was a meltdown of three, zero deaths, no contamination at Three Mile Island uh, at all. Fukushima had some releases that were offsite and very short lived. Chernobyl did have uh, about 56 uh, people that died, but half of those died in the, from blunt force trauma of the explosion uh, as that reactor blew up. It had a steam explosion. It went uh, beyond band edge and just went over power and, and blew it itself up with the steam. Uh, they were doing something stupid with it. Um, that was the topic of an entire another presentation. And the other people are the essentially the heroes that flew over it in helicopters, dumping sand in and getting off on the roof of the building to shovel in and cover up the reactor with sand and uh, other materials, trying to cut to turn the to get it to stop burning and emitting smoke. And those are the only ones that died. Nobody in the town died. Um, and even though they have evacuated it and left it um, completely empty, the town of Pripyat near, nearby is the closest one. You can go there now uh, to the Ukraine and take a tour of the place. Uh, there's no uh, radiation at all that's left over. It's all gone away. So here's a little bit on re uh, reactor history, not much. Generation one were um, carbon or graphite based systems. They're all Manhattan area and they're all dismantled now. Uh, Chernobyl was the last one. Generation two and two plus, which are the first five uh, Fukushima reactors as well, and some of the older ones here, um, they still had remote monitoring and stuff, but they were manually initiated controls, um, but they need power. And that's what happened at Fukushima. They didn't have power in reactors one through three, uh, and that's why they quit. So in generation three and three plus, we've learned to do that. They've had many safety features, you can turn it off and just leave. You can hit the scram button and walk out and uh, it'll, it'll leave it. It gives you three days to figure out what to do with it. And several of them have convection cooling now uh, and gravity water replacement by that. Uh, the, the wet well and the, going back to the other drawing, the wet well is down in the basement of the Fukushima reactor design. But now if you go to a modern system here, you'll find out there's a giant water tank in the top of the containment dome. And so all I have to do is hit a squib valve that opens it up and the water now drains by gravity and you don't need a pump. That's some of the safety features that they've got. And then we'll go to generation four a little bit later. Those are ones that are intrinsically safe. They can't burn, they don't have multiple fuel and a few other things like that. And some of them even, even use thorium and other materials that are not uranium, uh, at least not until they get radiated. We could talk about that. That's a whole nother paper as well. Here are some of those designs. Here's two of them. An American firm called New Scale is coming up with this over here. This is a reactor, and it's about the size of what could fit uh, on a huge flatbed semi-truck. 
In fact, that's what they plan to do is make these things and then ship them out fueled and ready to go. And all you do is drop it into a concrete sleeve in the, in the base of the ground that you've already prepared for it, uh, lower it down in there and then up here at the top, connect up the steam piping and uh, electrical systems and controls and monitors and everything is in the reactor and runs. And it does not have to be refueled. It'll run for about 40 years or so, depending on how much power you take out of it. It's anywhere from about 100 megawatts to 150, I think, depends on what size that they've got. And at the end of the 40 years, when the uranium is burned up and uh, no longer has enough uranium left in there to economically produce power, you simply disconnect it, take the entire thing out, put it back on the flat bag and ship it back to them. And they either store it, much like we now store Navy reactors at uh, the Hanford site in Washington, or in 40 years, they hope we'll have remanufacturing and, and um, recovery of the radioactive materials that are in there in order to make the part that you have to store substantially smaller. On the right is an innovative one that um, I don't think has been built yet, but they've demonstrated it. Uh, the pellets are, um, uh, think of those as ceramic M&Ms, but the chocolate is replaced with the uranium. And so you have the pellets in there, you drop them in at the top until you finally have enough that the reactor starts and runs. You take them out of the bottom to, uh, to turn the reactor off and throttle it that way. You can also check each one of the beads as it comes out and see if it's burned up all of its uranium yet. And if it isn't, you recycle it and put it back in the top. If it is, you take it out and dispose of it and put in a fresh bead at the top. This particular one also has uh, uses helium for cooling. That's in the, the yellow, as you see, going around and around with a, uh, a fan here, cools the helium, and then the helium boils the water in the piping, it goes from blue to red, and then out comes the steam. Uh, this is in a uh, uh, design from another country, which is why it's in the other uh, language. And then here we have some stuff like this, trying to tell you that there's a lot of things that are radioactive around us, uh, one is potassium-40. Bananas, as we know, are a good source of potassium. And so a, a good percentage of potassium is potassium-40, which is very slightly radioactive. You get 0 0.01 millirems if you eat a banana. And if you went to a nuclear power plant whose shielding is so good, and skip for the minute that they've got security around it, but if you walk up to the plant while well, it's thumbing away at 100% power and lean up against the containment dome and eat a banana, you will get more radiation from the banana than you will from the reactor. And then of course the banana stays with you when you walk away from the reactor. Other stuff that's radioactive is smoke detectors have a little piece of americium in it, ionize the smoke. Some kitty litter clays have um, um, radioactive material in them. Sandia Peak, the main meat, uh, mountain outside of Albuquerque here is a granite mountain and granite countertops uh, usually have some radioactive material in there. They're a good source of radon. And then you and I are radioactive ourselves because we do have uh, carbon-14 in us and potassium-40. In fact, if you've got a house full of granite countertops, you get more radiation from the granite countertops than you will living next to the nuclear power plant. And over here on the right is Sandia's annular core research reactor. <clears throat> it's a nuclear reactor built into a donut. And you can see this tube right here, if I can get the mouse to work, there we go. This tube is, goes down into the center of the reactor and you put an experiment down there and then run the reactor as a pulse mode and give an unbelievable dose of radiation to whatever your, your experiment is and see if it will survive. And uh, it produces radiation in the water that turns the water this beautiful blue color or turquoise color from the Bremsstrahlung radiation of the hydrogen in the water. But since it's under 38 feet of water and it only takes 30 feet of water to stop all radiation, you can be a tourist. You can watch it work. I've watched it myself several times and I'm still alive, uh, not dead yet from that. And it's a very uh, easy way to do. And it's a quite, quite a wonderful thing to see. It's, it's uh, that, that blue is indescribable and there's no shadows in there because the water itself is blowing. Uh, here is one of the problems with we have that right now <coughs> is called the linear no threshold model. Uh, and this was put out either by mistake or on purpose by um, a Nobel laureate who didn't want to change it when it was pointed out to him that it was wrong. He did not want to change it uh, because he had a Nobel Prize and didn't want to endanger that. 
But over here on this graph right here at this point where everything comes together, that's zero, zero. There's no health effects and there's no radiation. But the linear no threshold model says that any amount of radiation is deleterious to you. So as soon as you have some radiation, it starts down this line and goes into worse and worse and worse health effects. And that's something we also promulgated, uh, promulgated during the Cold War uh, to keep people scared of it so that we continue paying the taxes necessary to run the Cold War. But since then, the people that came up with these things have been testing them. And we found out that it is equal to the, lin the linear no, 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 no threshold model way out here. So these two lines are parallel, but that happens not at zero. It happens at about 20 rems or so, depending on the person. It's anywhere from 18 to about 30, depending on the person. And it comes up here over to this one. It doesn't start at zero because this takes into the account of the background radiation that we all have. So this is only radiation above the background. But notice this, that this is a J-shaped curve. It's an upside down J-shaped curve. It's up here. There is beginning to be a huge body of research, uh, hundreds of papers, close to a thousand of them, many of them on the web now, that show that low level radiation actually is beneficial for you. It keeps your immune system pumped up. Uh, there are people that are now doing studies to uh, reverse or at least uh, make Alzheimer's stable. They, what they've done is they bring people in and given them a brain cat scan uh, after hours. <coughs> and uh, someone that has uh, Alzheimer's and they um, become lucid for about a week and a half, two weeks, and then they can do that again. They have also been used on people suffering from um, lung distress because of the COVID-19 problem. Those that have extreme lung distress, they are finding out that a good chest X-ray actually helps alleviate that some. So this, this above the line optimum radiation induced beneficial effects uh, is a valid number. And we need some more research on that. And then finally down here, uh, there are some people uh, people with PhDs in medical and in an organization that I have been watching for quite some time. The people that uh, have set up such things as emergency evacuation routes and things like that uh, say that they are doing it on the side of caution, but they're erring actually on the side of endangerment in the view of Dr. Miller. And that is one reason why the 1,660 people died off in the uh, mass evacuation around Fukushima when they didn't need to do that. And found there down at the bottom, the dear fellow whose name I'm not about to try to pronounce says zero dose does not exist. There is no zero dose. The linear no threshold doesn't work. Um, I've got a couple of points that I would like to put out since the big casualty in Fukushima was in addition to the 20 some odd thousand people that died whom you never hear about, the other casualty is public trust in nuclear power. So here's two aircraft carriers that we have. Uh, the left one on, on the one on the left is the John F. Kennedy. I've actually had a tour on that boat. The one on the right is the Eisenhower. They are both, uh, they were both uh, based in Norfolk, Virginia at the Norfolk Navy Yard. And the Kennedy was the very last carrier we built that uh, burned oil. Uh, both of them are about the same size, about the same weight, and have about the same horsepower in their propulsion system. But at maximum power, when all four screws are going at maximum power and the boat is running at about 34 knots, 35 knots through the water, and they are launching aircraft off of three, all three catapults at once, which are steam catapults. They're distilling uh, seawater into fresh water and the galley is cooking in steam kettles for the 3,500 people that are on the ship. They burn 65 gallons of second of oil in the Kennedy. And because the thing is about a thousand feet long, it gets 13 inches per gallon. That's the mileage it gets. And we can't run it. It's mothball. We can't afford to run the thing. So it's gone. Um, it's sitting there ready to be, de it has been decommissioned and it's ready to be cut up and uh, taken apart. It'll be replaced. The name will be reused and the Kennedy will go on to the next, um, nuclear carrier we got. By contrast, the Dwight Eisenhower, about the same uh, year that it was made, has two, uh, it has over a gigawatts worth of power in its reactors. 
and in maximum power, it can it can go for years on that. It's only been refueled once. It was built in 1975. 30 years later, they put the first uh, refueling into it, and they expect it to keep it on uh, service for another nine years or so now. Uh, and by that time, the ship will be obsolete, even though the reactor is still working. Uh, the other example I'm going to give you is this one here, uh, the Palo Verde Generating Station, just a little south of you there, is um, one of the largest ones in the country. It's actually three generating stations, this one, this one, and this one on the same area, uh, but they're all independent. So you could shut one down completely and run the other two and whatever. And it sits there, it, had, it, it generates 3,300 megawatts. Uh, it's a three gigawatt reactor and it's been running since 1976, which is about the age of the number six reactor at Fukushima. Over in the San Juan Generating Station, that's the one that's producing the electrical power that uh, I'm running this computer on. It's uh, not, uh, it does most of the power in the Northwest quadrant of the state of New Mexico. It's about half the size of the Palo Verde Generating Station. Uh, and it has four coal, coal boilers from a coal mine that's right there next to it on the Navajo reservation. Uh, it is gradually being shut down. Two of them are still working. But when all four of the boilers were running full tilt and it's producing the full 1800 megawatts, it would pump out 19 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. In addition to 50,000 tons of uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides, half a ton of mercury and 3000 tons of soot that didn't get precipitated out from the plant. And it's being replaced now. Hopefully there is a law that is put in here that we are transitioning the state of New Mexico to renewable energy but since uh, one of my consulting jobs is with a nuclear, with a solar power company, I built a couple of one megawatt, one and a half megawatt solar systems. And uh, using the amount of territory that they take to put them down there on the ground, having aisles between the rows of uh, solar panels to service them and uh, put a security fence around it and whatnot, to replace that entire 1,848 megawatt plant to have it generate that amount of power during a short winter day <coughs> and store enough, over, over generate it, to store enough for a long winter night um, would take 16,000 acres of solar cells. That's 25 square miles just to replace that one plant. And the plant itself is only on about 6,000 acres. So that's, that's all it, it, you can't really do that. And that number only, uh, assumes that the next day is a sunny day. If we wake up to a snowy day and all of the solar cells are covered with snow or something like that, um, it's not going to work. So only here by going nuclear, of course, that's my, my, uh, that's my opinion, but that's the one I've got and I'm sticking to it. Here's my uh, reference information. I'm going to go through this real fast. This will be in the handout. Uh, if you order a copy of this thing um, from Joe, this just gives you the, the uh, common units, uh, rads and rims and whatnot, and then the standard international units for radiation. Uh, here's my sources, and I'm sorry they don't show up. I cannot, for some reason, get the link to, uh, to show up in a darker color, but it's there, and I've checked each one of these, and they do, in fact, work. Uh, these are uh, links to uh, some of the reference materials that I've got. And further down, down here, you'll see the TEPCO updates. That is the one where they are, they are still putting pages out uh, on the status of the Fukushima uh, recovery and decommissioning. And as an active site, some of the other ones. Here are some uh, articles that have come from the American Nuclear Society. I've highlighted parts in here that's important. Uh, the Regulatory Commission has added new safety rules. That's moving everybody from three to three plus safety. Tokyo Electric was aware of safety improvements that were needed, but they didn't want to put them down because of the economic cost and having to take the plant offline to do that. And legal and political consequences, they, would, they were afraid of being sued, saying if we put in more safety, somebody will sue me because it wasn't safe before that. Uh, and that was their justification. Uh, down there, the next one, it says more people die from coal pollution each day than have been killed by 50 years of nuclear power operation. And that's just from lung disease. That's the rest of it. Uh, I grew up in the Appalachian part of this country and 
there were coal miners that came back every day at five o'clock while I was delivering papers. They'd come back in town and their faces black and their clothes black. That was kind of a badge of, of honor that I'm actually working and helping keep this country going. But those people died early from uh, emphysema and whatnot. Uh, because, of course, we didn't have OSHA back then. Nobody had a mask or anything else like that. And down here, the next one says, of course, the only deaths attributed to the nuclear plant have been related to the evacuation of the residents, not to the radiation exposure. And finally, down there, the decontamination activities plus just rainfall have dropped, had made a drop in the radiation levels more than they thought. Uh, these are some of the papers that I've looked at. Um, all, uh, some of them are international. They're all available in the sites that I have had before. The other one is a, the, TEP, the TEPCO status report is a YouTube video. Uh, it's about um, seven, eight years old now. It's pretty informative and it's in English and pretty good. And I think that's the end of it. I'll take questions now or Joe will handle them for me. I've got one parting shot down there. If you can see nuclear power is available 90% of the time. Uh, hydropower works great except when there's a drought. Wind power works great except when it's not windy. And solar power works great except at nighttime, which it is here. And there I go. So I will unshare this thing and, uh, and go back to uh, Joe and say, Joe, if you're there, I'm ready to take questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Ho, for that uh, comprehensive and eye-opening look at Fukushima, what we've learned, um, dispelling some of the myths as well. And um, it's, it's actually fitting that you ended with um, talking about the other types of power uh, that are, you know, oftentimes talked about. Because one of our first questions is now, um, and you may, you may know the answer to this or not, but it's, um, are the Japanese people becoming more critical of nuclear power industry um, versus, and maybe favoring more unreliable um, solar wind energy sources. Do you find that there's a, a bit of a turn against the nuclear power plants among the Japanese people after Fukushima? Um, I don't know about it psychologically, but the, the Japanese people are always very self-aware of radiation. They, they've been bombed with two nuclear weapons. And they're the only ones that have, and they, they don't forget that. I think they agree to have nuclear power as a necessary evil. Uh, when the nuclear plants were all shut down at the, at the end of the, um, the Fukushima tsunami, uh, even though that's the only plant that was uh, damaged, all the rest of them were shut down by the government as a, a matter of course. And they all went to diesel backups and had shortages and everything else like that. And the, the cost of electricity went from about a, um, a 10 cents a kilowatt hour in, in English money uh, to about five or six kilowatt dollars a kilowatt hour. And they are gradually allowing the, the reactors to come back on. The government is doing it. And the Japanese people are, are very excellent and they have a, a very firm belief in their government. If, they, if the government says it's okay, they will agree to it. And so they're doing it. But there's a lot of people that are really scared about it. I think a lot of the um, um, deaths, uh, the 1,600 people that have died, uh, some of them were, were just terrified and scared to death, I think. But they did not need to be. Uh, better education and a better, better experience with uh, the reactors that we have and the safety we've got and all of the sailors that we've got in our, our many, many uh, nuclear ships should be an indication that it's safe. Perfect, thank you. And, and that's exactly why we do presentations, why your museum, our museum talk about these things is to better educate the public on, on nuclear power, the safety, um, as well as, the, like we said earlier, dispelling some of those myths. Now, another one is, is more about um, days later after um, the accident. Um, were there any, um, do you know of any information um, talking about nuclear illnesses to sailors um, days after the event? Were, were there any sailors on the ocean, Pacific Ocean, encountering any um, radiation sickness or anything like that? Or was it all pretty, pretty minor uh, in comparison? There were no radiation uh, illnesses at all that anybody had. There are some people that claim they got sick, but that's the kind of a thing where you have an upset stomach if you get worried. 
um, that was the best analysis on that. There was no radiation out there. Uh, there has been uh, some people saying this is all going to come all the way over. It's going to hit us in California. And of course, it did not. Um, there is one person that, you know, the Japanese eat an awful lot of fish. And one of the things they love is tuna. Um, it makes a good sushi. The ahi tuna makes a good sushi. But uh, somebody did a radio analysis of a tuna that was caught not far offshore. And they found some more than zero amount of radiation in the tuna. And they were all scared of that. And somebody did the calculation and said, in order to bring your radiation dose even up to the normal background dose, you'd have to eat 750,000 pounds of tuna per day. And that was so absurd that it actually turned into a joke. Um, and we didn't hear any more about that. Um, there was even a canister that floated clear over to, I think, Oregon and landed it was a shipping container that had been knocked off a ship by, um, um, by the tsunami and made it clear across the ocean, landed on, in Oregon. And they sent out the hazmat people and found out it was just full of motorcycles. It was absolutely clean at all. And, and well, it was rusting and it was halfway full of seawater. Um, the other question you asked, and I didn't get to it, uh, are they going to uh, solar or wind power? And no, they're not much because Japan doesn't have the room for it. Uh, we do here in Nevada and we do in uh, New Mexico and stuff like that. Uh, we might be able to find 25 square miles of, of solar uh, room for solar panels to replace that power plant. But what are they gonna do in Boston? What are they gonna do in Virginia? They don't have that kind of room and they don't have it in uh, Japan either. And I don't know that they have enough uh, space for windmills. Uh, I don't know the weather in Japan that well. But no, they are not planning to do what we call green power. Uh, my version of green power is nuclear power. Next. Perfect, thank you. Um, another great question is, could the plant have been built any differently to better withstand the natural disasters of the scale of, of you know, what Fukushima faced? Um, for instance, is there a way to prevent the spent fuel monitors from failing or backup power for electric valves? Was there anything at the time that they could have done differently in terms of the design? There is one. Um, I mentioned in the slide that, that the tsunami went over the seawall. They had, they had uh, planned for a certain height of the seawall and a certain earthquake and stuff like that. And I'm surprised that it actually made it as well as it did. But you might remember Hurricane uh, Katrina down in New Orleans was a category five hurricane and New Orleans had designed to make its dikes up to a category three. So here comes the category five and by golly, the, the dikes get over, overrun by the water and uh, floods out the city of New Orleans. Um, one of the things they could have done, uh, one of the reasons why the power plant is next to the ocean is because it's cheap cooling. Uh, if I went back to the Palo Verde nuclear plant picture that I had, you'll see a bunch of cooling towers out next to each one of the sites and those cooling towers have to have a source of water to cool and evaporate. And at least to their credit, they use reclaimed uh, sewage. They use gray water from the city of Phoenix to cool it so they don't use any new fresh water. But the reason why the power plant was there and there is two others, there's the Fukushima Daini plant number two. And then there's another one up uh, further in the, uh, in the coastline and one further down in the coastline closer to Tokyo. And the reason why they're on the coastline is, is cheap cooling from the ocean. One thing they could have done is move the plant uphill and move it inland a little bit, well out of the way of the worst case tsunami they can get to, and then run cheap pipe down to the ocean and get seawater that way instead of building right next to it. That's one way they would have done it. And I think if we build a new one, uh, we should have. I think there is a, a plant called Diablo Canyon in, uh, in California that's running and they've got it up on a bluff. So even though it's near the ocean, it's, it's nowhere near any kind of uh, tsunami that would ever come into the California coast. That would be one way to uh, um, guard against that. 
Thank you. Um, now, I know in your uh, presentation, you do talk about Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, but one of the questions we did have I thought was interesting mm -hmm. is, how does the radiation um, quality, quantity from Fukushima compare to Chernobyl? How are the, how are the types of, of such the radiations from these two similar, how they're different? Um, obviously one had more deaths than the other, but is there anything else that's significantly different about those two um, accidents? Uh, mostly the difference is the design of the reactor. The Chernobyl reactor was a generation one reactor that uses graphite moderation instead of water. And um, when the thing, they, they were doing a test to see how long they, if they scram the reactor, how long do they still generate steam before the diesels have to start, which is a neat, a neat thing to know. And they were doing it at night. And um, the problem is once you scram a reactor, it takes a while to get it started. And in order to, to meet the Soviet uh, deadlines that were on them at the time, this is before the Soviet Union folded, they kept having to pull the, the control rods and the safety rods further and further out of the reactor. So when it finally started at the last time, it went to massive overload. All of the water in there, the coolant water, blew the steam right away, cracked the reactor open, the fuel heated up without the cooling and caught the graphite on fire. So they had blown it open, um, cracked, the, cracked the reactor open, set it on fire, and all of the smoke and soot is going out there along with melted uh, particulates uh, from the, re the fuel itself, and that's what contaminated the site. Um, the other thing is that particular reactor in the Soviet Union did not have a containment dome around it. Fukushima did, and so did Three Mile Island. And so even though the reactor is melted, they did not get out of the containment dome or get out of the containment volume. Uh, Chernobyl didn't even have a containment volume. And so that's why that is the worst one going. And it also had particulates because you're burning the actual re reactor outside of containment uh, in the air. The All of the stuff that in my sketches I just showed you is in the bottom of the melted reactors now still inside containment. In uh, Chernobyl, that's what went upwind and uh, trash the countryside. But they have cleaned that up and it's all calm now and it's all back down to background and some people are starting to move back in. Um, Three Mile Island was not as bad as um, Fukushima because even though the reactor melted, it, it was not damaging the site. It didn't damage the site. In fact, reactor number one continues to run and only was shut down what is it, it's been 34 years, 30 years or so since that one, it, it, uh, reactor one continued to run and was finally decommissioned uh, just this past year, I think. Uh, and now the site is uh, being decommissioned. Next. Thank you. Um, now, one of the questions um, I thought was interesting because it goes back to what you're talking about, what they could do. Uh, in the future. And, and one of the questions that we had was uh, the TMI core was removed within a few years of that accident, uh, Fukushima. Now, do you think they'll bury the core with the plant when they put a concrete cover on it? Or do you think they might go a different route? Uh, I don't know what they'll do in Japan. I know here that much of the decommissioning of a reactor that has gone offline or, or gone to the end of its economic lifetime what they expect to do is decontaminate it. Uh, the fuel, of course, is taken out very quickly and given back to the, uh, the Department of Energy uh, where they take care of it. But the radiated part of the plant and everything else like that, they want to knock it down to a green field like the thing was never there. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. I, that's, that's an unnecessary expense. Uh, much like that small reactor I showed you at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, they, they entombed the reactor itself. The rest of the building is still fine and being used. And there's no reason why the industrial plant could not be uh, salvaged and used for another use or something like that once the reactor is gone, or even um, go ahead and put concrete in the old reactor and entomb it, leave it there as a rock, and buy some of the small modular reactors and put them in there and continue to use the site as a source of electrical generation for the neighborhood. Um, they could do several things like that, but there is the 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 cost of nuclear power in the United States is expensive as it is because of the regulatory burden and because of the burden that the company has to pay into a fund to eventually decommission it, which in the language of the regulators means knock, knock it down so that 
there is no evidence it was ever there. And so that there is less radiation at the site than there was from digging up the dirt that they put it in with. Uh, that's a little sarcastic, but that's the way I feel about it. Uh, one of the costs of nuclear power here is the regulation cost. It doesn't cost the US Navy anywhere near that much because they don't need those kinds of regulations. There is no evacuation route from a submarine, for instance. Um, a ah, wee bit of sarcasm there, a bad joke, but okay. Got another one? Perfect. Yes, I yes I do. Perfect. Um, so this is going to be the the one that we the last uh, question um, that we ask. I think it's a great way to end it. Um, <clears throat> now I'm um, talking about you know evacuation. Uh, now who's being allowed to move back into the Fukushima prefecture now? Uh, what kind of movement is there? Um, and is it something that is is you know increasing or is it still kind of at a standstill in terms of moving people back in? They have, I don't know the name of all the little towns. I've seen a map of it. They have allowed people to come back in to the area for all but the town that was in the background in that picture I showed you of the plant, the one that's within sight of the plant. They're all allowed to come back in. The problem is only about a third of the people are wanting to. The other thing is it's been 10 years and the place is trashed. I mean, you think what would happen to your own house if, if you just went away and had nobody maintained it or anything like that, the grass would go to heck, the trees would, uh, the roof would get blown off, uh, vandals would have broken the windows, that kind of a thing. You would not want to move back into a house that had not been lived in in 10 years. And that and the shock of seeing that is uh, when you move back in or go back to that area is as bad as uh, some of the people in California and in other places here that have seen their beautiful houses burned up by forest fires, they go back and there's a pile of ashes. Um, the psychological shock of that is, is terrible. And I think a lot of people are not wanting to go there or get back to it. Um, the statistics I have is of all the people that have been allowed to go back, only about 35% are agreeing to do so. The rest of them have said, I've been where I am now, 10 years, I'm going to go ahead and stay. Uh, you can't make them go back. But except for that one town that's the closest to it, they're all allowed to go back into the Fukushima prefecture now, as far as I know. Perfect. Uh, fantastic presentation, Mr. Ho. This was uh, a pleasure. I know I, on behalf of the National Atomic Testing Museum, our audience this evening. It was an absolute joy to have you. Very insightful presentation. And so thank you again. And I do wanna um, remind everybody that I will be sending, uh, anybody who emails me, I'll be sending you a copy of Mr. Hood's presentation, as well as reminding you that on Saturday, April 10th, um, at one o'clock in the afternoon Pacific time, we'll have Derek Hall, um, from the Nevada National Security site talking about the plants and animals of the site. And that's also a free presentation. So um, thank you for everybody for being here. Thank you, Mr. Ho, and you all have a wonderful evening and can't wait to have you back for our next one. Thank you very much. <laughs>